Catholic Family Podcast presents Lent Around the World Daily Traditional Catholic Meditations Read by our friends from across the globe The Passion and Death of Our Lord Jesus Christ by the Most Reverend Albin Goodyear Part 32 The Second Word This day thou shalt be with me in paradise we may pass quickly by the incident that follows. Evidently, the evangelist recorded because of the fulfillment of prophecy that it contains. Indeed, the 21st Psalm dominates much that in no way told of the scene on Calvary. It would seem that the writers have it chiefly in mind when they select the events they choose to mention. The Psalm begins, O God, my God, look upon me, why hast thou forsaken me? Later it takes up the theme. I am a worm and no man, the reproach of men and the outcast of the people. And they that saw have laughed me to scorn. They have spoken with the lips and wagged the head. He hoped in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him save him, seeing he delighted in him. Many dogs have encompassed me. The counsel of the malignant hath besieged me. They have dug my hands and feet, they have numbered all my bones. They have looked and stared upon me, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. In the light of this prophecy, we may read what the evangelist next tells us. It was about midday. Then the soldiers, after they had crucified him, took his garments, and they made four parts, to every soldier a part, casting lots upon them what every man should take, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said then to one another, Let us not cut it, but let us cast lots upon it, whose it shall be, that the word might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They have parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they have cast lots. And the soldiers indeed did these things, and it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And they sat down and watched him, and the people stood beholding. So briefly, yet with so much detail, have the evangelists put the scene before us. Here, more than anywhere else in all the Gospels, the story takes on the action of a drama. Upon the rock, by the three crosses, are the Roman soldiers, four in number, as we are carefully told behaving in such a way as would seem to show that the crowd was kept from gathering too near. These four men had done their work. For the rest, they were too callous to care. Suffering in other men afforded them amusement, as it had amused them an hour before, when Jesus lay bleeding beneath the scourge. If they were Romans, their betters could find a Roman holiday in the butchering of the gladiators, and they could follow their example. If they were Syrians, for the Roman army in the east was recruited from them, they were trained in a school of cruelty even more appalling. Besides, they had other things to occupy them than the mere agony of criminals. The victim's clothes lay on the rock where he had been stripped. They were the perquisite of his executioners. They shared the clothes among themselves, shaking their dice over them for him who should have first choice. The long robe was too good to be torn in pieces. They tossed their dice for it apart from the rest. That seamless garment which has meant so much, in fact and in symbol, to succeeding Christian ages. Below the rock, between it and the city wall, ran the narrow road from the hill country of Judea and Samaria and Galilee beyond. To the city gate. Within the gate was the bazaar. There was therefore much coming and going by that route, but chiefly at that hour, and on that busy day, there was more coming than going. Along that road, the crowd that had come out of the gate following the procession had been made to halt. Now that the worst had been done, it could say and do no more. But there were the passers-by, men who cared little for these commotions, men to whom religion of any kind was only a nuisance, intent on their own affairs, their business and their merchandise, 
they were still not sorry to hear that another religious mischief-maker had been silenced. They cared nothing for the kingship of Jesus. It had no money value. The title of the Son of God meant little to them. It was not in their vocabulary. They were busy men and practical. Good Jews, it was true, but Judaism meant to them, for the most part, the paying of dues and the social status attached to belonging to the synagogue. But though they made nothing of religion, they could willingly take part in the cry against one to whom it meant much, and it was easy to find words to revile him. This man, so they were told as they passed through the crowd, had threatened to destroy their temple, their national monument, one of the glories of the world, worth untold gold. Whatever other charges were brought against him, such a one deserved to be crucified. And they passed him by, each hurling his own particular insult, joining in the abuse of the mob, careless of justice or injustice, for justice was suspended when religion was concerned. Justice was a matter of business. And they that passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Bah, thou that destroyest the temple of God and in three days buildest it up again, save thy own self. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. But apart from the common herd, which here, as everywhere, knew little what it did, and whose numbers from many indications were not overwhelming, there were those who had been most responsible for that morning's work, the chief priests with the scribes and ancients. These were gathered, some by the rock, but not too near, lest they should be contaminated, others on the city wall beyond, from which they could look down on their victim as he hung in his agony beneath them. They too had at last achieved their heart's desire and could do no more. It had all come so suddenly, the collapse of their enemy had been so complete, they could scarcely yet trust in their success. For long they had sought his death, and he had always escaped and defied them. He had told them plainly that he would lay down his life when he chose, and not one moment sooner. He had called them openly before all men a wicked and adulterous generation. He had pronounced woe upon them and warned others against them because of their hypocrisy. In their own domain, the temple court itself, he had defied their authority. In that same court, he had fought them with their own weapons till they dared ask him no more questions. Once he had warned them that they saw, however, they affected not to see. They saw, but they would not believe, and the fault, the guilt, was theirs. If you were blind, you should not have sin. But now you say, we see, your sin remaineth. Now at last they had him wholly at their mercy, and the mockery they had not dared to use before, they poured out upon him, full measure flowing over. Not even in the court of Caiaphas had they been so bold. Then he had still warned and threatened, but he would not answer them now. Of that, by this time in the day, they were confident. He would not come down from the cross. The way he had submitted to them all that day and all the night before assured them that, at last, his power had been broken. He had worked miracles before. That could not be denied. Now they had proof enough that all were mere tricks. For if he saved others, much more should he be able to save himself they had asked him for a sign, and he had refused to give it. Now, if he so chose, he might give one which would compel all the world to believe. If he were the Christ, if he were the King of Israel, if he were the Son of God, let him give a sign which would be beyond all question. He had spoken of the sign of Jonah the prophet. He had used empty words about rebuilding the temple in three days. Here, was a sign more tangible, more convincing. Let him save himself from death. Let him come down from the cross, and they would believe. They did not add that if he raised his dead body from the tomb, they would not. Or again, he had called God his Father. He had said the Father was always with him, 
He had claimed the protection of that father and his legions of angels. In the security of the father's care, he had put himself above their own father, Abraham. He and the father were one. Now was the occasion to vindicate his claim. Now, surely, or never. If God the Father had a special care for him, let God the Father deliver him from his deathbed of shame. That would be a miracle indeed. That would be a sign that none could controvert. In like manner, the chief priests with the scribes and the ancients, mocking, derided him, saying, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the Christ, the King of Israel, if he be the Christ, the Son of God, let him now come down from the cross, that we may see and believe. He trusted in God. Let him now deliver him, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. So the cries continued, even from these usually self-controlled men. And they were all the more vehemently uttered, because behind them there was still the haunting fear that this man whom they had crucified might yet accept their challenge. But in answer to all their cries, the King of Israel, the Son of God, said and did nothing. Who does not know that man is at his noblest, or has the opportunity of being at his noblest, when he is most beaten and down? Then may he prove, as at no other time, his endurance, his magnanimity, the depths of his generosity and love. And if the ages to come were to be stamped with this ideal, if his elect, the greatest of the sons of men, were to be persecuted even unto death by their brethren, then it behooved the leader of them all to give them an example, to go before them all in shame and suffering. Not by coming down from the cross, but by remaining on it till the last drop of blood was shed. Not by yielding to his enemies' demands, but by fulfilling to the last iota the will of his father, would he prove himself the first among the children of men, the Lord and Master of the world, the Son of God. Not Jesus the judge and vindicator, but Jesus the lover, and he crucified, would be the glory of his saints and the power that would transform the world. Lastly, the Roman soldiery, the executioners and the guard, took up the insults hurled at Jesus by these leaders of Israel about them. Already in the courtyard of the praetorium, they had had their sport with this king. The title they had fixed above his head gave them cause for endless merriment. Death such as this was the only fate that pseudo-kings deserved. Indeed, it was good to see him in agony, to watch his face turned upward as if the sight of this sordid and unfeeling world were too much for him, to trace the streams of blood that flowed from him and bespattered the ground. They lifted their goblets to the king, as they sat on the rock beneath him. They invited him to share their liquor with them. He who had eaten and drunk with publicans and sinners might not disdain to drink with the soldiers of the guard. They held a cup before his lips as the blood flowed from between them, shouting the while in his face, King of the Jews, save thyself. But perhaps the abuse that cut deepest into the heart of Jesus on the cross was that which came from the crosses on either side of him. From the Roman soldiers, he could expect no better treatment, though even from them, before the tragedy was over, he was to receive his meed of honor. From the elders and the leaders of Israel, he was reaping only that which he had reaped from the beginning, though by them too, by friend and enemy alike, he would be treated worthily at the end. But there was one class to whom he had always been drawn, for whom he had always had a peculiar fascination. He had been known in life as the friend of publicans and sinners. He had risked his very reputation for their sakes. Only this morning he had been classed with them, a malefactor, as if the fact had required no proof. Often in his life, by word and deed, he had defended them. He had declared that such as they would enter the kingdom when the more self-righteous would be cast out. 
He had spoken parables which had all proclaimed his predilection for the downtrodden. For the prayer of the publican, for the broken prodigal, for the lost sheep that he would seek at whatsoever cost to himself. And in return, though in his lifetime he received insult from others in plenty, there is no record that he was ever insulted by publicans or sinners or the outcast. As at the beginning, men of this type had gathered round John the Baptist, so had they come to him. There had always been understanding, whatever their state, they had always known him as a friend. And yet, at this moment, even that consolation seemed to be denied him. For the first time, these his beloved turned against him. In the selfsame thing, the thieves that were crucified with him reproached him and reviled him. If he was, as men reported, the friend of sinners, if he had said, Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you, had he not now an unmatched occasion to prove the truth of his words? As they too writhed in their agony on each side of him, though stupefied in part by the drink that had been given to them, they joined in the cursing of the crowd. If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. Still, as from others, so from sinners, recognition came at last. Indeed, since in life and in death he had given most to them, so from them he received the one consolation of Calvary. One of the convicts continued his abuse. The other grew silent. He had heard the prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They were strange words to come from the mouth of a condemned and convicted criminal, stranger still from one who was said to be a king. But they were words of prayer, and prayer became a dying man. Would that he too could pray, and could go to the God of his fathers, to the bosom of Abraham, with some sort of contrition in his heart, with some word of hope on his lips. He ceased his own raillery. If he could, he would check the abuse of his comrade. His arguments might not be convincing, they might be confused, but his soul was in his words, and they would say what he had in mind. And one of these robbers who were hanging blasphemed him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Neither dost thou fear God, seeing thou art under the same condemnation. It has often been noticed in the life of Jesus how a grace accepted has been the harbinger of another. Jesus led his own to himself step by step. We have seen it in Simon and Nathaniel in the first days by the Jordan, in the Roman centurion at Capernaum after the Sermon on the Mount, in the woman who was a sinner at Magdala, in the rich young man who came to him in Perea, even though at the final step he failed. Nay more, when he asked for anything, when any confessed him as he would be confessed, how generously Jesus poured himself out beyond the suppliant's dreams. A paralytic came to him to be healed. Jesus sent him away, healed in both soul and body. A poor creature fell at his feet, penitent. He had made of her an intimate friend. An apostle confessed him to be the true Son of God. He made him the head of his universal church. So most conspicuously of all, as if he would set this last seal on all he had said and done for sinners, was it here with this dying criminal. The man had seen and had felt compassion for the dying sufferer beside him. He had felt compassion and had defended him. At once he received his reward. There came to him the sight of his own guilt, and the grace of contrition came with it. And with contrition his eyes were opened. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. He saw his own guilt in the justice of his sentence. He saw the injustice that was being done to the man beside him. Then came another grace, another vision, revealed to him not by flesh and blood, but by the Father who is in heaven, as long ago it had been revealed to Simon Peter. Not only was Jesus innocent, 
being innocent, he must indeed be that which he claimed to be. He was a king, of a kingdom not of this world, of a kingdom which he would enter, even through the gates of death. Others had asked that they might sit, the one on his right hand, the other on his left, in that kingdom. The penitent criminal had no such ambitions. He was hanging on his right hand now. That was honor enough. For the rest, if afterwards in his kingdom this king would but remember his companion in death, he would be more than glad to die. Already he knew in whom he believed, he knew in whom he trusted. Even on the cross, he who was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel had not failed the sinner who looked up to him, had gone after one, and had found it. We may watch the growth of grace step by step, from light and understanding to yet further light, as the crucified penitent continues. And we indeed justly, for we have received the reward of our deeds. But this man has done no evil. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou shalt come into thy kingdom. It was indeed a tremendous act of faith, of the kind specially dear to our Lord Jesus Christ, and in a special way it must be rewarded. As he had rewarded his mother's faith long ago at Cana, as he had praised and crowned the Roman soldier's faith at Capharnaum, as the Syrophoenician's faith had been honored by him in the country about Tyre, as Simon's, for his brave confession, so now, for this unique recognition of him, this solitary voice among all the execration, Jesus would reward this man in his own lavish way, full measure flowing over. Remember him? That alone would have been much. It is all that a dying man will often ask of a friend. But it was not enough for the heart of Jesus Christ. Remember him in the kingdom? The very word kingdom no longer satisfies him. Jesus turned his aching head towards his companion in suffering. He spoke with that emphatic introduction which he had always been wont to use whenever he proclaimed a solemn truth. From his throne on Calvary, he spoke and acted and bestowed his largesse like a king. Then Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to thee, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. It was language worthy of a conqueror, spoken on a field where a battle had been won. It was a reward worthy of Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, the Son of God from a criminal, in an instant to a saint, the first of the new dispensation, with this unique distinction granted to no other, that he was canonized before his death.